Hey guys, Griffin here. Today I'm going to talk about why I think that ETH is in trouble. Now I don't think ETH is going to disappear overnight or anything like that, but I do think that there are some upcoming headwinds that we need to be wary of and just keep in mind going forward that uh, ETH has its work cut out for it and we better band together if we're really going to see uh, ETH continue to be a dominant force in the cryptocurrency space. And uh, today we're going to talk about the reasons why I think that. So let's get right into it. Uh, first, I think that competition is really moving into cryptocurrency, uh, primarily in the form of a Federal Reserve-backed digital currency, or at least digital exchange medium, uh, because they're going to be offering free transactions. And what that means is that uh, blockchains like Ethereum or Bitcoin, for example, won't necessarily be able to compete on a sending money transactional basis um, for users that don't really care about being outside of the Federal Reserve's jurisdiction. And so that's a really big deal because that's most of people. <laughs> and uh, most people don't really care, uh, you know, about being inside of, of some kind of database from the Federal Reserve and uh, having their transactions tracked because they already have their transactions tracked through many credit card companies and PayPal and the like. And so for them, why would they pay an extra $1.50 to have money sent through and they can have it for free and it's accepted by much more of the uh, uh, retailers that they use in their day-to-day -day life? It just doesn't make much sense for the average consumer. Really, the cryptocurrency is there for uh, decentralization purposes, as well as interaction with smart contracts and uh, NFTs and whatnot. And so that the, the average user doesn't really need those things in their day to day life, then they're going to be uh, hesitant to adopt something like Ethereum that has some of these downsides. Right. And so that kind of competition. And I'll leave a link to the video uh, that I have on stablecoins and explaining the Fedcoin in more detail uh, in the comments below if you want to check that out as well. But that kind of competition, I think, coming into the space is going to be really devastating for a large swath of crypto, especially stablecoins. And I think that ETH might have some of that uh, fallout levied against it as well. Uh, ETH has a lot more use cases just as programmable money, smart contracts, and, and NFTs like I had mentioned prior. And that's the main reason why I personally use ETH. But I do think that some people will be discouraged from joining ETH just because of the competition coming into the space from the Fedcoin, as well as other new chains that are coming online as we speak. Even in this bear market, there are still new types of cryptocurrency rearing its head and older chains that are coming to life as more development resources are being brought to bear. And so the, that leads right into my second point, which is that capital is becoming increasingly more difficult to get a hold of. And so if Ethereum wants to continue to have the biggest developer uh, ecosystem, they need to be able to actually pay those developers well, be it through uh, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, or actual companies and corporations that are willing to foot the bill for this development uh, in order to get their slice of the pie. And we're seeing less and less of that. In fact, we're seeing a ton of layoffs in the tech space in general. Uh, I'm, a lot of my friends have been personally affected by tech layoffs recently. And so that makes it really difficult for us to get young people who are willing to work in tech to actually uh, you, you know, want to, to work on Ethereum and, and make it so that this ecosystem continues to grow at the rate that we've seen. And so that headwind in particular is going to be difficult to surmount in the near term. I think as we get into the next four to five years, you know, we could see capital conditions returning to the sort of low rate environment that we're used to. But I don't think that the Federal Reserve is going to be quick to return to that type of scenario. And that's really bad for tech in general. And Ethereum is that bleeding edge type of tech that is really going to be hard pressed to acquire talent if there's no money to be had, right? And so that capital borrowing is going to be uh, become more and more apparent as a difficulty in the next six to 12 months when these rates really take place in the economy. Um, but right now we're sitting at four and a half percent on bonds. So why would you uh, put your money with any kind of risky lending uh, when you can get four and a half percent guaranteed from the United States government? I mean, it's it's insane to go with anything less than 
an 8% rate right now, which isn't really sustainable by most companies. And so something that is a bleeding edge like Ethereum is really going to have a, a hard time attracting developers uh, and just that, that level of risk. And the last point that I want to bring up that why I think ETH is in trouble is just because of the L2 segmentation that's going on for the user base. Now, layer twos are a really nice solution and a really well implemented and technically impressive solution for the problem of scaling up a large decentralized network. But I think that it's kind of illogical and that it might be the wrong approach for user experience because what we're doing is we're taking the already segmented group of people who use Ethereum and then moving them to other blockchains, uh, say like Arbitrum, in order to actually continue to use the security of the base layer one Ethereum blockchain, but have faster transaction speeds and lower transaction costs through using tech tricks like Merkle trees or uh, zero knowledge proofs in order to submit more transactions per block back to Ethereum. And while this is a really great solution, if everyone is on one particular layer two solution, I think what we're seeing right now is that most people are trying to use all of these layer two solutions or at least a portion of them. And so as we continue to gate content behind certain layer two implementations, I think that's going to make it worse and worse for the overall ecosystem of Ethereum, especially from a user perspective, because you're essentially entering a walled garden that you have to then jump back down to the Ethereum layer one and then jump up to another layer two if that's what you're intending to do. Or use a bridge service in order to get from uh, one layer two to another. And it's made even more complicated by side chains like Polygon because they don't use the underlying base Ethereum chain for security. And so you have to bridge funds over. And bridges are typically a very weak point in the security for blockchains. And they have been responsible for a loss of a large amount of money. Um, the Axie Infinity hack was famously taken by uh, North Korean hackers taking control of their Ronin bridge. So I think that while layer twos are technically impressive and a, a good solution, I think that the logic behind them makes no sense. Like we should be taking the base Ethereum that we have now and moving that down a layer, become, making that become a base layer or a layer zero, and then building an entirely new L1 blockchain around that that is called Ethereum, and that's what users transact on, and it submits a Merkle tree or a zero-knowledge proof down to that base layer, the consensus layer, that is controlled by stakers and nodes, but not that transactions settle on. And then we can scale that so that everyone is always on that same L1 Ethereum blockchain. Instead of segmenting users into layer twos, and putting them in wall gardens at the behest of corporations who are making all the profits on the transaction fees because it's essentially their blockchain. They're just using the base Ethereum layer one as security, right? And so that kind of attitude of splitting the, the user base is I think going to come back to bite Ethereum. Not to mention it creates a lot of problems that are really difficult to solve from a development perspective. Um, so things that I've been trying to work on to solve uh, that are not easy to fix, right? And so uh, things like, you know, getting your funds from one L2 to another is very complicated and difficult to explain to someone who doesn't know the ins and outs of how this stuff works. And I think that that is going to be the biggest hurdle. It should be painless as possible. And right now it's really, really painful. <laughs> it makes no sense unless you're like immersed in this stuff. And so that's why I think that you know, ETH could have some really potential headwinds uh, going against it for the next few years. And I'm not sure what they're going to do to solve it. I hope that we as a community can come together and try and figure this out because the things that have been built on top of Ethereum are amazing. And I really want to see that continue. And now, again, I, I just want to clarify, I don't think that that will stop. I just think that, uh, you know, if you're looking for price appreciation in ETH, you may not find it for a while. It's, it's going to be difficult to create that value that we've been promising thus far because of the difficulties that I've outlined above. So if you haven't taken a look at the stablecoin video, please do. I'll leave it in the, in the comments below. And uh, 
that's all I have for you today, guys. I hope you learned something. I hope you have a great day. I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks.